Wow, this is fun. <laughs> I'm having fun now. <laughs> this is my favorite thing to do, my favorite social thing to do, that is. I'll talk about this area of spiritual uh, ideas called sacred geometry. I'm an artist. Uh, I've always been an artist from the time I was a, a baby. I, I've always known. I guess that's kind of the only really unusual thing about me. I really knew exactly what I wanted to do from the time I was little. That's kind of unusual. And I've been uh, off and on that path over the years, and uh, I keep getting directed back to it. And I mean, even when I was a baby, I, I saw it as a spiritual idea. I saw it as a spiritual goal to make art as an assignment. Like, uh, my artistic abilities was a, re a gift, really, to be used for spiritual purpose. And I felt that from a very early age. And that's primarily what I do. And I've been led to the ideas of mandala and, and sacred geometry and I'm pretty hermetic, I'm pretty, uh, pretty much a recluse. Uh, I've spent lots of time by myself. But it's been such a healing process, my experience with mandala making and sacred geometry has been, been so healing that I started to perceive that, uh, wow, everybody needs to know this. And so I was called uh, like a shaman in a way to try to express what I've, I've come to know to as many people as I possibly can. That's my primary goal for the, for the rest of my life is to... I feel a little bit like um, Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> you know, except I'm, I guess I'm Charlie Geometry Seed. Or <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm out there, you know, looking for some place to plant, plant these seeds. And that's one of the major things I want to try to get across is that this thing called sacred geometry has this huge appeal to both what you could call left brain and right brain simultaneously, which is a very rare thing. And so on the one hand, it appeals to the scientific uh, sequential time-space kind of mind, the mind that thinks about logic and numbers and mathematics and that, those kinds of things, and it satisfies totally and then at the same time, it, sacred geometry, and the ideas of sacred geometry, and the realities of sacred geometry appeal to our, our heart mind, our knowing, the knowing in us, the, our intuitive sensibility, simultaneously. So I, I believe that if we could be introduced to these ideas, that we would see the world entirely differently. And and when I first got involved with sacred geometry, it was so mystical, so powerful, 
And I was so excited about it that I tried to tell all my friends about it. And, you know, I'm stumbling around trying to find words that, for something that there aren't any words to. And I would say, but, but, but Sam, you got to, this is, it's, you know, and I would start to talk about it and their eyes would just glaze over in about five seconds as soon as I started talking about it. And I said, oh my God, this is not easy to do. This is really, really hard. Well, I've been practicing <laughs> for a long time. And I think that I, I have the words, I believe. And that's what I pray for. I pray for that Spirit will allow me to find the words and to find the passion and to find the, the, the truth in a way that will touch every single person that comes to this workshop this afternoon, somehow. I don't know how, but that is my goal and that is my intent to touch everyone and to plant some kind of seed that will significantly affect the quality of your experience here in, in this time space opera that we're in the middle of. So when we, one of the things we're going to do this afternoon when we get going into this workshop, I've got this book which is all loaded with cool stuff. I made this so that you can disassemble this and you can scan it and you can put it in your computer, you can duplicate it. That's the idea. Yeah, and there's lots of templates in here. Now you can make your own mandalas and I want you and encourage you to play with these forms in here. All right? So even if you'd come and you just get the book and you stand up and you walk out, you'll be ahead. <laughs> but if you stay, <laughs> oh yeah, you'll get a lot more. So I just wanted to say one more thing and I'm going to let, go, I'll let you go. And it, I was struck when this candle uh, was lit because the whole essence of sacred geometry is based on single-pointedness, oneness, uh, at one -ment, atonement, uh, unity idea undivided single-pointedness. And um, when Joanne said uh, this, this light, this, which represents Christ consciousness, is everywhere, yeah. That flame and that little dot is a manifestation of single-pointedness. And that flame is in all of us, the same flame, the same single point. And that is the whole essence of sacred geometry omnipresent, omnipotent unity and the way it unfolds into duality and the way it returns to unity. This is an ancient, ancient, ancient understanding. I mean, it goes way, way back beyond Hermes Trismegistus. It was there before the flood. And now, and now after thousands of years, at least 5,000 years, the scientists are saying, wow, there's this thing called quantum physics. And it's saying single-pointedness becomes duality, and then it becomes unity, and then it disappears, and then it comes back. Wow, this is a mystery. <laughs> Even science is embracing the incredible mystery of the universe, the magic of it. They're actually dealing with it, right up against mystery. Science and mystery like this for the first time. I love it. We are really going to have a lot of fun this afternoon, and, and we're going to have a lot to, to share with one another. And I really, really appreciate the opportunity and hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Can you feel sacred geometry? Do you feel the natural attraction? Come to our next workshop. You'll love it. I guarantee it. Run it? Yeah, I see the little red dot flashing. That means it's running. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Talking about sacred geometry.
about 95% of the people that I talk to that are interested in sacred geometry have come to it uh, intuitively. Something about the form, something about the shapes attracts them. They're being drawn intuitively. That's about 95% of the people. The novice, the novice that gets interested in sacred geometry is almost always instantly confused, daunted by the unbelievable amount of information all of a sudden just flowing over them. That you can't take it in. And when I talk to people like that, they ask me, hey, Charlie, make it like baby talk. I can't understand this. Pretend I was in the sixth grade or something. What is sacred geometry? And when they ask me that, I always dig in my pockets and I look for some change. I'm looking for seven nickels or seven dimes or seven quarters or seven yen or seven shillings. I put them on a table. I put one coin in the middle. And I put six coins right around that one coin so that they're all touching one another perfectly. And when that happens, when I get that pattern just right, I point to it and I say, that's it. That's sacred geometry. They go like, what? That's it? That's sacred geometry? That can't be it. Just think about it. That is a perfect principle of the universe, right in front of your eyes, an unchanging principle. Something that can't change, won't change, has never changed, is going to be the same until this universe goes away. And because it is unchanging and a perfect manifestation of what you could call God mind, the intelligence behind this universe, that's why it's sacred. That is why it's sacred. Seven is a very magical number, always has been. Always has been associated with spirit, always has been associated with something magical, mysterious, mystical. Those seven circles, those seven coins, are actually the heart of the famous icon of sacred geometry called the Flower of Life. Another interesting thing about the seven circles is that they perfectly fit in two circles of common radius. These seven circles relate to so many levels of sacred geometry, it's, it's pretty uncanny that they fit into this whole system in such a perfect way. They go on and on. In the past, the people who were interested in sacred geometry were very interested, primarily interested in the mathematics and the science aspect of it. But now, we're starting to feel that sacred geometry is some kind of a spiritual relationship to the universe. And we are seeing it more and more as a doorway into those aspects of God mind which are eternal. So when you hang out, with these forms, when you hang out with mandala, when you hang out with the forms of sacred geometry, you are opening up a doorway into a timeless reality, into the timeless perfection. Don't be freaked out by it. It's just get into it one step at a time. That's what we're doing with these videos. We're, we're trying to create little vignettes that will give you one little piece of the puzzle at a time. So now, you see, when your friends ask you what's sacred geometry, you just get in your pocket and you pull out your seven pennies. Put them on the table and you say, that's sacred geometry. Point A around point B, that makes a circle. But these two single points are clones, and those two points have equal potential. So not only can point A rotate around point B, but point B can also rotate around point A. 
This is one radius that both circles share. That black form in the middle there, that's called the vesica piscis or the vesica piscis, depending on what you prefer. The vesica piscis is literally the womb of the universe. This is the whole essence of the universe. I'm not kidding. Sounds like a real crazy thing to say, but two circles of common radius and this shape in the middle that it makes called the vesica piscis is the whole root of sacred geometry. Literally every single thing that exists, and I'm not kidding, everything that exists springs out of this womb, this football-like shape. It sounds like a wild, improbable, crazy thing to say, but it's absolutely true. Everyone pretty much agrees. The universe is created by division. That ultimate mystery, that great creative force, which is the all, God-mind, unity consciousness, that oneness divides and becomes duality and voila, the Big Bang. God-mind as single-pointedness divides and becomes duality and all relationship begins right there. And out of this relationship, of course, two circles of common radius and the vesica pisces. Vesica pisces. So let's look a little closer at this vesica pisces, huh? Right there it is, that's it. When we get to four circles of common radius, which naturally evolve out of these points C and D, the Vesica Pisces is in the middle. But we have now five Vesica Pisces inside four circles of common radius. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, interesting. With the creation of those points C and D, we have, within the Vesica Pisces, a triangular situation. So we started with unity, we evolved into duality, and now we have an evolution to Trinity. This is the birthplace of trigonometry, an entire division of mathematics born in the Vesica Pisces. Huh? Those two points, C and D, bisect the Vesica Pisces and create the cross in the center and a new center, point X. So this introduces the transcendental nature of this pattern. It slips all the way into infinity and all the way out to infinity with smaller and smaller and smaller overlapping circles and larger and larger and larger overlapping circles all the way 
to infinity. So, you can't learn about the Vesca Pisces in a few minutes. This is an unbelievably deep and rich form, literally the womb of the universe. Everything that is springs out of the Vesca Pisces, everything. All unfolding and spiraling and spiraling and spiraling into what we see as this manifest universe. We are sacred geometry. We spring right out of the Vesica Pisces. Omnipresent principles of the universe. That is what sacred geometry is. And the Vesica Pisces, or the Vesica Pisces, is right in the heart of that. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, how you doing? Check out my new mandala. Yeah. After a lifetime of making art and over 25 years experience with mandala making and sacred geometry, I have come to see this universe as one gigantic communication system. It's all talking to itself. A perfectly correspondent consciousness, a vibrational consciousness, as manifesting in three specific languages, three primal root archetypal languages. I call them sacred sound, sacred sequence and sacred geometry. This mandala that's behind me here, this mandala, this holds aspects of all three of these sacred languages. Number one, it vibrates. That's pretty obvious. Number two, it makes numbers and sequences of numbers, both simple and complex and it illustrates an archetypal reality of sacred geometry called concentric circles and the squares that can happen inside those concentric circles. The archetypal language of sacred sound teaches us about the unchanging universal correspondence of vibration. The repeating harmonic and discordant aspects of music are obvious manifestations of sacred sound. And the new mother with a baby at her breast. Now that is a magnificent example of sacred sound. Those tender cooing energies the mother makes to her baby. And that tiny innocent human being knows exactly what those vibrations mean. The language isn't English, or French, or German, or Chinese, or Polynesian, or even Lakota. But that baby feels those vibrations and understands. That, my friends, is sacred sound for sure. For sure. Pure communications in vibrations themselves. The archetypal language of sacred sequence teaches us about the nature of time, counting, and numbers. The most esoteric archetypal aspect of sacred sequence is the conceptual numbers themselves. Oneness, twoness, threeness, fourness, fiveness, etc. Mathematics is an obvious aspect of sacred sequence. If we look at the universal mathematical vibration called pi in the universal language of form called sacred geometry, we see the circle. If we look at the same vibrating energy in the language of sacred sequence, we see the numbers called pi. A good example of exoteric down-to-earth sacred sequence 
begins when a newborn baby's umbilical cord is cut, and he or she takes that first breath. That moment begins our life as air-breathing creatures and also begins thousands of sacred sequences marking our experience of time in heartbeats, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, etc. This concludes the number of breaths we take and the number of trips we make around the sun. And so in this trinity of languages, the circle is not only vibration, sacred sound, but it's also sacred geometry form and it's also simultaneously sacred sequence numbers. Our physical bodies respond powerfully to the language of sacred sound. We feel it in our bones and in our heart. We sense it. On the other hand, sacred sequence appeals to our rational capacities, our rational capabilities, our abilities to go from point A to point B to point C to count. This is left brain sequential stuff here. Now, the great bridging language is sacred geometry because not only does it touch us intuitively and we feel it, not only that, but we also can look at it and see the perfect empirical mathematics there simultaneously. It's very, very rare. Let me show you some examples of just how clear sacred geometry speaks to us, how beautifully and tenderly and intimately it speaks to us. The circle is the first enclosed form of sacred geometry, both dynamic and static. It is perfect completeness enclosing all, all that is. It is oneness, the heart of all holistic thought. The two points which create the circle also naturally create two circles of common radius and the vesica pisces. And both the equilateral triangle and the square spring directly from the vesica pisces. And this brings us to one of the most beautiful and consistent realities of this language called sacred geometry. It's a correspondent polar duality called dynamic position and the static position. This easily understandable visual reality is an important key to understanding the messages that are coming from sacred geometry. This is the archetype of sacred geometry known as the two circles of common radius in its dynamic position. And this is the same archetype in its static position. Here in the static position, this archetype feels at rest, grounded and steady embracing gravity. In its dynamic position, this same archetype, two circles of common radius, feels very different, as if it were perfectly balanced, defying gravity and holding the possibilities of motion. This is an equilateral triangle in its static position. This trinity has a graphic voice of powerful stability, at rest and solid, as it points to the heavens. Now we see the same equilateral triangle in its dynamic position, perfectly balanced on one of its corners. The root numbers of this trinity remain the same, but the graphic voice, the vibration, is slightly different. This is a square in its dynamic position, and here it is in its static position, and each feels very different. The static square is the essence of inertia, total stability and the dynamic square speaks to the polar opposite. The root mathematics and form of the square have not changed, but the vibrational correspondence has changed. All of the archetypes of sacred geometry hold specific vibrational energies, which are all omnipresent, omnipotent realities, forever speaking to us about the true nature of the universe. Yes, the universe is talking to us in three beautiful sacred languages and I'm really interested in all of those languages but as an artist I really love sacred geometry I really do because not only does it satisfy my 
left brain, my brain of reason, my brain of that's interested in logic and science and numbers and all of that, but it also satisfies my intuitive heart mind and it brings me into these intimate receptive places with something infinitely larger than I am. The rules of the universe, the archetypes, the roots. Wow. And the more I keep listening to this language, the more it keeps teaching me. And the more it keeps teaching me the more I am healed. So now I'm trying to express these ideas in the simplest possible way so that you all will have a chance of beginning to feel this thing called sacred geometry and to feel this thing called sacred sequence and to feel this thing called sacred sound and to somehow put these all together and make them work in your daily lives. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Namaste. Namaste. Another very important and interesting aspect of sacred geometry concentric circles so one of the truly wonderful things about sacred geometry is that you can actually see it all around you when you have the eyes when you can see you can see and when you can see it's all around us in us through us everywhere at work omnipresent omnipotent it's a very very beautiful thing you want to see a clear manifestation of sacred geometric principle called concentric circles? Toss a rock up in the air and let it fall into a pond. Kadoosh! Concentric circles. Very beautiful. There are numerous examples of concentric circles in nature. Tree rings are a perfect example. Tree rings are like a slow motion version of this waveform phenomena. Each ring marks the passage of an entire year. Another trip around the sun, another ring, another trip around the sun, another ring. It's like a language, like the tree is talking to us, telling us its life history in these rings, like chapters of rings and the rings of Saturn. Now there is a spectacular, monumental manifestation of concentric circles. And the solar system itself, all the planets falling around the sun in more or less concentric circles. Beautiful. So how does this natural possibility of concentric circles relate to this language called sacred geometry? It traces right back to nature's first pattern. If we count out one radius at a time from any of the centers of nature's first pattern, we find the possibility of concentric circles expanding, expanding all the way into infinity, all sharing the same center. The first circle out from the center in nature's first pattern is traditionally called the germ of life. The second circle is called the seed of life. The third circle is called the flower of life. And the fourth circle is called the fruit of life. As they expand, each of these four circles share specific qualities and yet each holds ever more potent sacred geometric possibilities. 
The germ of life creates numerous graphic possibilities, including a six-point star, the hexagon, and equilateral triangles, two of which form the archetype known as the Star of David. It even brings forth the famous peace sign. The seed of life, the second concentric circle, holds all the possibilities of the first plus more, including the famous archetypal form known as the yin-yang, perfect symbol of duality in general, and specifically projective and receptive energy, also known as gender energy. The seed of life also holds the famous Kabbalistic graphic known as the Sephrothic Tree of Life, which is so multifaceted that it can be contemplated for lifetimes and has been. This brings us to the extremely important flower of life, the third concentric circle from our chosen center. Drunvalo Melchizedek is the being who is most responsible for bringing this form into the contemporary mainstream. Of course, it's always been an archetype of sacred geometry, but he actually brought it forward. I met Drumlow around 1990 and became his immediate fraternal friend as both of us had spent countless hours contemplating and meditating on sacred geometric archetypes. Drumvalo believed with all his heart that the flower of life, the third concentric circle, was the key form, the key archetype of sacred geometry, and then that was the thing that everybody should be studying in a primary way. On the other hand, I just as firmly believed that it was two circles of common radius and the Vesica Pisces, which was the root form. And that's where the real key study was. But he said to me, very sincerely, he said, I understand why you would feel that way, Charles. I really do. But trust me, it's the flower of life. Well, I wasn't totally convinced, but on the other hand, I respected Drumbelow so much that I couldn't argue with him. But now, I'm seeing that we are both right at the same time. Because, in essence, each of these archetypes is a layered possibility of the same sequential geometric energy, and each, in its own way, points to the transcendental nature of this pattern, nature's first pattern. The original circles in nature's first pattern both naturally enlarge in size and naturally reduce in size creating a never-ending circular and spiraling dance of contraction and expansion all the way into both macrocosmic and microcosmic infinity. The infinite matrix of two-dimensional sacred geometric possibilities is the root conceptual architecture of the universe. The fruit of life is a flat plane, a conceptual plane, and yet it hints at the third dimensional plane. That is truly significant. As we expand our radius of comprehension into the fruit of life, we discover the famous graphic known as Metatron's Cube, an illusion of the three-dimensional platonic solids, the tetrahedron, the hexahedron, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron are all to be found inside this one graphic form known as Metatron's Cube. That's really mind-boggling. In fact, Metatron's Cube is so significant that it deserves its own chapter, so that's coming up, you know, keep an eye out for that one. As these concentric circles continue to expand beyond the fruit of life, ever more complex possibilities evolve. I have created thousands of mandalas and graphics based on the archetypes of sacred geometry, both directly and indirectly connected concentric circles. And these experiments have proven to me that this study is literally limitless.
I know by direct experience when we concentrate our visual attention on the perfect omnipresent omnipotent principles of the universe known as sacred geometry we set ourselves up for the ultimate possibility of human experience profoundly personal spiritual intimacy with unity consciousness the all it's very obvious there's really a lot of fascinating mathematical possibilities, scientific possibilities within this thing called sacred geometry. But that's not what I'm primarily interested in. I make mandalas to get closer to spirit and to allow spirit to guide me and teach me through this language. That's what I do. And I I have such profoundly beautiful and wonderful experiences that I just am forced to try to share this. It's, uh, it's that good, folks. It's better than sex. Well. There is a fascinating aspect of sacred geometry known as Metatron's Cube. And this is what it looks like. I've been making mandalas based on this archetype for a really long time, over 20 years. Thinking about it, contemplating it, meditating on it, just listening to it all these years. So the first question is, who is this guy, Metatron? Who is this being known as Metatron? Where did he come from? If you investigate, you find that Metatron was an archangel who was mentioned in Islamic, Judaic, and Christian mythologies, medieval mythologies. He was considered to be the scribe of God. So this would make the archangel Metatron the equivalent of the ancient Egyptian scribe of the gods known as Thoth, Hermes. Now, According to legend, a scribe of God would understand the root principles of creation, which are almost always associated with sacred geometry. In fact, the Archangel Metatron is many times pictured with or holding a cube. So that's a little bit about Metatron, the guy Metatron. But the graphic known as Metatron's cube didn't show up till later when a medieval Italian mathematician named Leonardo Pisano discovered it. So the next question is, why and how did Leonardo come to call this particular graphic Metatron's cube? Well, the answer is simple. Number one, he probably had read, or not probably, he read the histories of Metatron. He was familiar with the legends. And number two, he was also familiar with sacred geometry, probably initiate in one of the schools, one or more of the schools, that held those secrets. So between those two things, it points to the connection that Metatron's cube has with sacred geometry. And it traces right back to nature's first pattern and the 13 very special circles that are found inside the fourth consecutive circle of nature's first pattern. That's where it comes from. And when you connect the centers of those 13 circles, you get Metatron's cube. Oh yeah. Leonardo Pisano discovered, and this is the really cool part, Leonardo Pisano discovered that you could create an illusion of all five of the platonic solids in this graphic that he had discovered. And he called it Metatron's cube. Connecting the edges of four equilateral triangles creates the tetrahedron. 
Connecting the edges of six squares creates the hexahedron, or cube. Connecting the edges of eight equilateral triangles creates the octahedron. Connecting the edges of twelve pentagons creates the dodecahedron. And connecting the edges of twenty equilateral triangles creates the icosahedron. That's a tetrahedron. That is a tetrahedron. Four sides. This is the root crystalline archetype right here. Three-dimensional sacred geometry, very close to source. Extremely close to source. Now when you systematically study this phenomena of Metatron's cube, you discover that the first three platonic solids, that's the tetrahedron, the hexahedron, and the octahedron, are perfectly blueprinted inside this two-dimensional pattern. But when you get to the next two, the dodecahedron and the icosahedron, you find that they are not perfectly blueprinted in Metatron's cube. The dodecahedron is almost perfectly blueprinted in Metatron's cube but six additional short lines must be added in order to complete the form. The icosahedron is another story, as the illusion is definitely not an accurate blueprint. This fact discourages many of the most investigative students of sacred geometry and causes some of them to negate the significance of Metatron's cube. This is very understandable, but I believe unfortunate. So one of my major goals for this piece is to re-establish the credibility of Metatron's cube. And this is the whole key right here. Metatron's cube is a transcendental form. It reduces, naturally reduces in size, smaller and smaller and smaller Metatron's cubes and larger and larger and larger Metatron's cubes all relating to one another empirically, expanding all the way to infinity and all the way into infinity. And with the additional centers that those transcendental aspects of Metatron's cube create, it's very easy to get a perfect blueprint of both the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. This is really significant and this makes Metatron's cube actually work as a perfect blueprint. Now this is the most interesting and esoteric point as far as I'm concerned. Metatron's cube beautifully illustrates the mental nature of the universe through this unfolding of two-dimensional realities into three-dimensional realities. Very interesting, very important. To back that up, let me read this little paragraph and tell you a story about the invention of the piano. That's a good one. Bartholomeo Cristofori di Francesco of Padua, Italy, developed the first major piano from the harpsichord around 1720. Hmm. This major innovation was conceived when the inventor experienced a blinding flash of revelation, which he called the pianoforte. So I can imagine that Bartholomew woke up one night out of a dead sleep, wide awake, he says, Maria, Maria, I've got it, I've got it. We'll strike the strings with little hammers. We won't pluck them, no, we won't, we'll strike them with little soft mallets. This is big, Maria. So Maria thought he was mad, of course, and so did a lot of other people, but that didn't bother Bartholomew, oh no. He held this idea in his mind. He wouldn't let go of it. He thought about it, he started making drawings, he started making models, he started raising money, he spoke for it all over the place. He just held on to this idea and wouldn't let it go. And out of his mind precipitated this invention of his called the pianoforte. Is that amazing? That is the way it works. 
beautiful illustration of the way the universe works. The piano could never have become a reality until it was first mentally conceived. Conceptual ideas on all levels always precede manifest realities. And this is the nature of the universe. The Hermetic axiom reads, the all is mind, the universe is mental. And Metatron's cube is teaching us about this conceptual mental nature of the universe. And the current experiments in quantum physics are also teaching us this exact same thing. Nothing can be created without first being a conceptual construct of consciousness. Without a mental conceptual equivalent in consciousness, nothing could exist. And sacred geometry is the creator's conceptual architecture out of which all things precipitate. Amat Goswami, the brilliant quantum physicist, teacher, and philosopher, says it extremely succinctly, quote, You can make sense of this world only if you base the world on consciousness. Consciousness is the ground of all being, and quantum physics makes this as clear as daylight, unquote. I would say that Metatron's cube also makes this as clear as daylight, as clear as daylight. Consciousness is the ground of all being. Yeah. Hey, here I am again. New painting I just started. But that's not why we're here. Today we're dealing with the tremendous healing potentials of mandala making and sacred geometry. This little piece, this animated meditational piece, is based on a ancient spiraling graphic which is directly related to sacred geometry and long associated with healing powers. It is tremendously potent. So just let this piece wash over you and enjoy. If you decide, let go of something you don't want and let this piece do its magic. Namaste. Namaste.
couple of months ago, I made this little video called Sacred Geometry Healing Animation Number 11. And this painting was in the background, just begun, but people noticed it somehow. And that got me thinking. So now I'm making this piece based on the process of making mandalas, because people always ask me about that too. They ask me about software. What kind of software do you use to make your mandalas, Charles? And I use uh, this software right up here. This is the software. And the hardware is, this is the hardware. It's a compass and a straight edge. A straight edge and a compass is all you need to make sacred geometric archetypes. It just unfolds all by itself. So I've been making mandalas based on the archetypes and icons of sacred geometry for over 25 years. And my first goal is always to make them beautiful. That's the major goal. But at the same time, they're also connected to empirical realities, to unchanging empirical realities of sacred geometry. So I'm dealing with intuitive, mystical, so-called right brain kinds of stuff, and I'm also dealing with crystalline perfections of the universe, unchanging principles of the universe. Left and right synergy is the goal. So now we're going to talk about this painting, which is called The Map of Time. And this is the way it looked in the video. And then this is the way it looked in successive stages of completion. This is the way it looks. It's somewhere over 300 hours. I don't know how many hours. I lost track. So why would I possibly want to put 300 hours or 400 or however many hours is in this thing? Why would I want to do that? That's the question we're going to answer. So when I make a mandala, it always starts with a, an idea that's been rolling around in my head for X number of days or years. So this mandala is really a meditation on time and our concepts of dividing it. Both the astrological chart and the face of our 12-hour clock are based on this sacred geometry. To be specific, it traces to the second consecutive circle of nature's first pattern, commonly known as the seed of life. The ever-expanding pattern of this mandala is created by two overlapping versions of nature's first pattern. The radius of the vertical version is set at 1 inch and the radius of the horizontal version is set at 1.73 inches, which is very close to the exact proportions of the Vesica Pisces height versus width. So as I was creating this complicated overlapping grid, I had to constantly check as I developed it outward I had to constantly check to make sure it was lining up and if I made a tiny error here then it would get to be a big error over here and that gave my left brain so to speak something to occupy its energies and it was a repetitive energy because I had to keep solving the same problem over and over and over and over like beads it's like mantra so this repetitive mental activity occupies my left brain and leaves my right brain free to gather any information that, that comes to me. These mandalas always start with a prayer. I ask the universe to teach me about this particular aspect of sacred geometry. And I know that I can be directed to an understanding through this meditative process and this revelatory possibilities of uh, this kind of open-eyed meditation. And I find myself slipping further and further and further, deeper and deeper and deeper in, into my own uh, inner world, so to speak. And 
sometimes as a result I find myself floating around on the ceiling watching myself paint like somebody else was pushing the paint around. So of course I have to say something about color. That's the one area that I don't think about. <laughs> I just feel that completely. It's completely intuitive. What I do is I mix a, a large palette of colors in small bottles for the specific painting and then I blend those colors together on, on, a, on a palette as I'm working and uh, that's where the variation comes from. One of the really beautiful things that I see in this piece, I see in this, this relationship, is that we have a, a balancing kind of play between projective and receptive energies. Just like an astrological chart. Projective, receptive, projective, receptive, projective, receptive, all the way around coming back and starting over again. And so we have this nature's first pattern in yellow going vertically, which is projective. And then we have another nature's first pattern going horizontally, the green one, which is receptive. So this center, conceptually, is everywhere and nowhere beyond time. And that center can move to any part in this grid and it will be the same center and the same potentials will come out of that same center and so when you're harmonizing with these kinds of ideas and when you're actually experiencing something that does transcend time it's very easy to step over yourself and to, to get a clear view of where you've been and where you're going and time has a very strange way of flexing back and forth in, in the same moment. No matter where you go, there you are, in the same center, the center of the universe. So I think it's really interesting that I intuitively used this painting a map of time in that video which was dealing with a healing animation because this whole process that I use is very very healing and it's ritualized and many people will say that a no healing can happen unless there's ritual involved some kind of ritual and in my case it's the ritual of creating mandala based on the archetypes of sacred geometry It harmonizes me with these very transcendent universal principles which transcend time and space. They are quantum in their potent. So how can you make mandalas? You could get a compass, straight edge, start drawing your own circles, you could also go to my website because there's free templates, free mandala templates on my website. You could download them, you could color them. That would be cool. You could also buy one of my prints. That would be real cool. <laughs> I'd like that. I could eat. <laughs>
Yeah, this is the frame. Yeah. Just four pieces of wood, nailed and glued together. So it's very simple, isn't it? You just staple them together. Very simple. Just pine wood. It's uh, called fairing strips. Yeah, fairing strips. Simple is good. Absolutely. Strong. The last many, many, many years. So now you're going to draw a design on there, right? Yes, now you can use your creativity. With this, you can use magic markers. This is a really fast and easy way to do it. Magic markers, or if you like, you can use paint, crayons. So you uh, want to color the surface. Yes, you know this whole drum is geometric. Of course. We're, uh, we're using a square. Uh, in Africa, they use uh, an animal skin to cover the drum, but we're going to use a very modern material. And so it, the design could be very, very loose. It doesn't have to be tight. It doesn't have to be tight. It can be as tight as you like to make it. Right. Or as loose. Or as loose. Or as organic or whatever. Lines and colors also have significance, especially within the African tradition. But obviously this could be applied to any, uh, any system, Native American system, any symbolic system. Absolutely. The more you, you, you get in touch with other indigenous peoples, cultures from around the planet Earth, even though the languages are different, the meanings are the same. Yeah. The heart is the heart, huh? The heart is the heart. And the heart rhythm keeps coming up all over the place, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's, it's amazing that drums are instruments that are played by all peoples, no matter where you are on the planet. Everybody has some type of a drum that they play. So what we're doing is we're creating patterns. Repeating patterns like drums. That's right. Rhythms. It's a rhythm. We're repeating this rhythm. That's another consistency with sacred geometry. Repeating rhythms, repeating patterns. Absolutely. This is a, a, it's, it's a, it's a frequency. So anybody can do this? Anybody can do it. This is so simple that anybody can do this. Kindergartners can do this, as well as senior citizens. So another bridge maker, huh? The drum is a bridge maker. Absolutely. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a, uh, a phrase that my, one of my teachers, Chief Bay, used. Is that right? Yes. He, he always told us that the drum is a bridge. So one of the beautiful things about this is you could have probably under ten dollars in this completely. Oh, without a doubt. So anybody could make one of these things. Anybody can make one of these. This is clear plastic packaging tape. You can buy it at any hardware store or office supply store. And uh, we will apply this tape to the drum frame to make the surface of the drum that will resonate and create the sound of the drum. All right, let's do that. Pick it up, turn it over. Keep repeating this pattern. Pull it tight until I get to the end on the opposite edge of the drum. So now we have this first layer and we're going to do something very special now. We're going to use another piece of uh, artwork that we have created that is based in sacred geometry. Oh yeah. That's sacred geometry for sure. So you're going to color that, huh? So now we're going to color this. And that's transparent. It's transparent. And we're going to uh, color it. And then we'll cut the design out and place it on top of this drum surface. Wow. Cool idea. Okay. So again, this is just like coloring. Kids do this, in, in, you know, from the time they're babies. Like a coloring book, huh? Absolutely. This is a very 
relaxing. Wow, this is meditative in itself. That's always my experience. I get extremely high making uh, mandalas based on the archetypes of sacred geometry. Opens up a doorway, just like drumming does. So are you going to do double sided tape? I'm going to just, I've taken a piece of tape and folded it back on itself. And I'm just going to use that and put it right here to hold this in place uh -huh. so it won't move. And I'll start on the right hand side because I'm right handed. I'll start on the right side, lift it up. And you're not too, you're not putting it tight yet. I'm not putting any tension on it yet. But now you're going to start. Now, I've locked it in place. Now I'm going to start putting tension on the tape. Uh -huh. Okay, now. That's it? That's it. Wow. Now I'm going to give you the rhythms that you need to know in order to earn your stick. Rhythm number one. Rhythm number one is one repeating itself. It is the pulse. Rhythm number two has two beats. It sounds like this. Rhythm number three has three beats, and it sounds like this. Rhythm number four has four beats, and it sounds like this. One, two, three, four, open. Now that you know those four rhythms, you have earned your stick. <laughs> okay. It's a lot of fun to get together in a big circle with a lot of drummers, many of whom have different types of drums from places all over the world, from different peoples, different cultures, different races. But everybody gets together in a circle, a unity circle, and plays together. It just uh, shuts down that part in your mind that talks and talks and analyzes and criticizes and judges and has all kinds of thoughts about the past and the future. This drumming in the circle helps you to just be in the now, in the moment of now. And in that moment of now, that's where you feel the presence of the heartbeat. And that presence of the heart, and the rhythm of the heart, the beat of the heart, it connects with the universal rhythm of all the people in the circle. And then that resonates with the heartbeat of humanity.
Hold your mind to the center. High sun. Desert wheel. Gender. Green shield. High pine. Earth wheel. Yellow shield. Red clay sky. West, east. Sky power. Gender energy. Spring wheel. Hold your mind to center. Thank you.